So I'd like you guys to meet Jillian Tett. Uh, she is an anthropologist turned journalist, currently uh, works at the Financial Times. She's from England, but lives in the US with her family in New York. Uh, unfortunately got COVID this week and so can't be with us in person. Uh, Jillian um, is going to give us, I think, a wonderful talk on communicating anthropology to people who may not be anthropologists. How do you do that? How do you do it effectively? So Jillian, go ahead, take it away. And I've, I've got the clicker so I can, when you tell me to hit a new slide, I will. Thank you very much indeed. And can I start by saying to everybody how sad I am not to be with you. Um, unfortunately, I got COVID unexpectedly early this week. And apart from the fact that I'm not feeling so great, I'm also still testing positive. So I don't think I should come anywhere near anybody else. Um, and I'm really sad not to be with you because A, I deeply appreciate what Elizabeth and Tim have done over the years to put anthropology on the map. And everyone who's in the hall, listening to them or in your, in your seminars, you should appreciate the fact you're really lucky to be led by two of the greats in terms of championing business anthropology. Um, but secondly, the topic that you're talking about is really important and really dear to my heart because I have spent much of my career in the last 25 years as a journalist being asked by people Basically, how come you're so weird? You know, you, you're working in the world of business and financial journalism. You cover economics. Um, you know, you seem normal. You seem like an economist. These are economists speaking. And yet you're actually really weird because you have this weird background in anthropology. And I am passionately um, devoted to the idea of explaining to people that actually having a background in anthropology is not weird. It's actually very, very powerful and useful. And I would argue is needed more than ever before now. But I also know that it's really hard to tell people who are not anthropologists why anthropology is so valuable. Um, I often joke that the discipline suffers from what I call the Indiana Jones problem that you know to many people who are not anthropologists anthropology seems like indiana jones for academics you know a sort of discipline that's very exotic and interesting and makes good conversation at dinner parties um, and people think wow how exciting but actually also seems a bit old-fashioned and dusty and weird and exotic and frankly useless so much of my life as my career has been spent trying to explain to people that anthropology is more than Indiana Jones and it is very vital and relevant and I would argue more vital and relevant than ever. And what I want to give to you is three key ideas about how to communicate anthropology. I'll come back and talk to them in later on, but at this point, I want to highlight three key points. Firstly, if you want to communicate to people about anything, you have to remember what I call the domino theory of communication. And I don't mean dominoes in the sense of having pieces of plastic topple over in a chain reaction. I mean dominoes in the sense of the game that you play dominoes with a piece of plastic that has two numbers on and one half of the domino, one number, has to match someone else's domino but the other half can be different. And you need to think about that for communicating because if you want to persuade somebody who's never thought about anthropology, why they should care, you have to start by tapping into something they already know or think and then take them somewhere different. You have to match your domino with their domino. So you have to connect with them on some level and then take them somewhere different. And I'll explain to you in a moment what I mean by that with anthropology. The second point I want to do to communicate is if you want to explain to people why anthropology matters, think of the slug that we sometimes talk about in media called news that you can use. News that you can use. You need to tell people why anthropology can be helpful in solving problems they face. Not abstractly, but why something tangible they face can be helped 
by having anthropology. And the third idea I want to give you, which is gonna be the most controversial, is the concept of compromise. Because in order to communicate anthropology, you're gonna to have to make some compromises intellectually along the way. You're gonna to have to boil down really complicated ideas into short, sharp, snappy, elevated pitches. And you're gonna to have to recognize that a world that is driven by shades of gray sometimes has to be presented as being a bit black and white to communicate. And you may not want to do that, and I respect that. But if you want to communicate, that is the essence of trying to actually get your message across. So I'll come back to those three points later on, and let me start by talking a bit about myself and my own journey. Um, and maybe Elizabeth, you can put up my first slide and click through the cover slide to the, to the first picture, which is this. Um, I started my life very much in the classic mold of anthropology in the um, sort of British tradition in the late 19th century, um, if you like, um, sorry, not sorry, sorry, late 20th century, not 19th century. My, I've got quite a lot of brain fog with COVID. Um, and um, I did my PhD at Cambridge University at a time when British anthropology was very much driven by this concept of participant observation. We were all trained in Malinowski um, and this idea that to be an anthropologist, you went off somewhere um, usually quite, you know, seemingly different to your own life and immerse yourself in that community for a year or two to study a different culture and to do really part one of 101 anthropology, which is to make the strange familiar. Go recognize that a different culture has a different way of thinking and organizing its life. Immerse yourself in their way of being to really try to understand how they live. So I went in the last two years of the Soviet Union to Soviet Tajikistan on the borders of Afghanistan and lived in a Tajik community um, as a Tajik girl. You can see this is me um, in 1989 um, when the, in the village I lived in. If you click to the next slide ahead. Um, and I had a really amazing couple of years of my life with a stunningly wonderful community. That's me in the top right hand corner um, with the people I was living with. Um, and if you go to the next slide and I was studying Tajik wedding rituals. Um, that was a topic of my thesis. And in a very classic anthropology way, I used the analysis of the symbols and economic and social networks and rituals and worldviews around wedding rituals to explore how the Tajiks reconciled their conflict identity of being both Islamic and Soviet communist at the same time, and what that meant about their ideas of ethnic identity. So in many ways, very, very classic um, anthropology. Now, while I was out there, the Soviet Union broke up. There was a brutal civil war. Um, I actually became originally a human rights um, person and then a war reporter. And that's how I joined the FT. And I got hired by the FT and I decided I wanted to be a journalist, um, not an academic. And um, I came back to London and the Financial Times said to me, well, if you want to join the FT, you have to go and study economics and finance, which I thought was stunningly boring initially. Um, but I joined the FT, did that, and then realized that actually this was a whole new world for me to uncover, which was much closer to my own culture, but in many ways just as fascinating and just as in need of anthropological insight as Tajikistan. So if you show the next slide. So I went from looking at what I sometimes joke was the different tribal groups around Tajikistan into studying what I call now the Davos tribe the um, group of people who pretend to run the world, the people who run banks, who run um, finance ministries, central banks, big companies, and do congregating rituals like the Davos World Economic Forum, or in television studios, or in the last couple of years in Zoom calls. That's me doing a Zoom call with people like Jay Powell, the chair of the US Fed, Christine Lagarde, Yi Gang, the head of the Chinese Central Bank, et cetera, et cetera. If you go to the next slide, um, or in this case, um, FT Financial Times corporate events, which is out in Silicon Valley with Sheryl Sandberg and others a few, <coughs> a few years ago. <coughs> Excuse me, that will strike back. <coughs> anyway, okay, you lose the slides now. <coughs> so basically that was my life. Um, that, that was my life, is my life. And in some ways, 
they seem utterly unconnected. <coughs> but the message I try and con convey to people, and they ask, well, you have this background in anthropology. Why on earth would you go from this weird background from studying Tajik wedding rituals into looking at the Davos tribe, international finance and business? The message I try to communicate always is, well, actually, humans are humans anywhere. And wherever humans congregate, whether that's in Tajikistan or in the central banking communities in the world or the financial markets or in corporate um, C-suite, um, they are always engaged in rituals. They always have cognitive worldviews and maps. They have social networks. They have a sense of identity. Um, they have all the things that make us human in any context which can all be analyzed and should be analyzed using the tools of anthropology. And exactly the same skill set I use to study Tajik wedding rituals can be used to study the Davos um, rituals. They can be used to study an investment banking conference or a corporate setting or a central bank meeting or anything else. Um, in fact, they're incredibly, incredibly useful. And that isn't just a theoretical construct, in my own experience, I used exactly the same toolkit I used to study Tajik wedding rituals to study investment banking conferences. And by doing that, by deconstructing investment banking conferences in 2005 and six, that helped me to see that the financial system was spinning out of control and was going to, I didn't know the scale of the financial crisis, but was going to head into some kind of crisis. Um, using an anthropology mindset um, has helped me to see the risk of tech clash that Silicon Valley would come under attack. Um, I wrote columns in 2012 warning that the Silicon Valley was going to face the same kind of backlash as the financial system had faced in 2008. Um, using anthropology helped me to understand the appeal of Donald Trump in 2016 and to write columns warning that Donald Trump was likely to win the 2016 election, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So time and again in my own career, my anthropology training has helped me be a better journalist and to see what's happening. But it's not just about me at all. Um, you know, Elizabeth hopefully will have told you about the way that she's used her anthropology training, the work she's done, to understand the General Motors culture in ways that are truly fascinating and very, very insightful and incredible, re incredibly relevant now. Um, Tim has done incredible work looking at all manner of consumer cultures in a similar way, again, using basic anthropology um, and trying to use this analysis of symbols and rituals and cognitive maps and shared worldviews and identities um, to really understand what makes us tick as humans. So the point is that anthropology is really, really valuable. But to go back to the point about how and why one should communicate this and go back to the three points I mentioned, I think you need to realize that you can't just rock up and say to people who are non-anthropologists, this is useful, believe me. You have to find ways to really touch them with a message that resonates. So in my case, what I tend to do is to start with the domino theory. And the domino theory, as I said, is you have to try and tap into something that people already know first to actually get them to listen. And then you take them somewhere else. You can't start cold and basically persuade somebody or connect with somebody or grab their attention by telling them something which is so far out of their own sphere of experience, they have no way to relate to it. So what I do when I'm trying to talk about anthropology is to start off by telling people and presenting the slides as I did and saying, listen, so you think anthropology is all about a whole bunch of Indiana Jones style academics going off to study things that look exotic and weird and different. Um, that's what you think anthropology is. And guess what? I kind of did that in my past. I went off and lived in a community that seemed very exotic to many people living in the West, which was Soviet Tajikistan. And yes, I did live, live there um, in a kind of not quite Indiana Jones style, but something that seemed very different from your normal experience. And at that point, people go, yeah, yeah, that's what I think anthropologists do. But what I then do is say, but you think that's kind of what anthropology do? Well, guess what? You're wrong. 
Actually, I then went and used that same experience to study how Western investment bankers worked in 2005 in relation to credit derivatives. So that exotic picture that fulfills your stereotype that grabbed your attention was actually how I started, but I used the same skill set to use in the modern world. And that is why anthropology is very, very relevant. And what you thought about anthropology, dear non-anthropologist, is wrong. Anthropology today is just as relevant for the Western world as it was in Tajikistan. So that's what I mean by the domino theory. And that can be used in many, many, many circumstances. So somebody like um, Elizabeth, who in early stages of her career, um, used anthropology to study in, you know, um, Hispanic migrant farm workers in the South of, um, South of America, I believe. Um, she basically, you know, I mean, that, again, that seems like classic anthropology. People think, oh yeah, anthropologists go and study people who seem very different from us or the poor, or the dispossessed, you know, that fulfills a stereotype. But then you say, well, you know what? That anthropology was just as relevant in looking at General Motors workers on the assembly line in the factories or looking, one of my favorite bits of Elizabeth's work is looking at what she did, amazing work, looking at how people misunderstand each other in meetings. Um, you can then say, okay, well actually guess what, it worked there. So if you're trying to communicate the value of anthropology to non-anthropologists, think dominoes. Think about tapping into something they already know or think a stereotype, even if you disagree with the stereotype or something which actually clicks with them and hooks them in and then doing, if you like, jujitsu, turning the tables and changing what they think about something into something else. Domino theory. Second key point is news you can use. And again, I've shamelessly tapped into this in my own career. And that's again, what Elizabeth has done as well. Um, where basically I say to people, listen, the whole point and the value of anthropology is it helps you to think about the world differently. It makes you look afresh at problems you didn't know you had. It makes you see things you didn't actually think about looking into before. It helps you to uncover social silences. Um, and social silences is something which I find resonates with people because it's really partly out of fear. Everyone's really scared about stuff that they ignore, um, surprises they've, you know, going to be tripped up in. So if you tell people, actually, if you don't have an anthropology mindset, you're going to be tripped up by social silence the parts of the world you ignore, they start to pay attention. So in my case, um, the story I often tell, and I tell in my book, is about how using my training in looking at Tajik wedding rituals and applying this to an investment banking conference in 2005, helped me to see what the ba bankers were ignoring about finance in 2005, which was the degree to which they were completely disconnected from the end users of their financial innovations and the degree to which their own creation mythology in finance had massive glaring contradictions at the very heart of it. And in terms of this news you can use idea, <coughs> I then say, and the news that you can use in this case was that basically you could take this mindset and then foresee this financial crisis that was going to come. Um, and that was valuable. It was useful for anyone trying to not be tripped up by a financial crisis. Um, and you can do that in almost any context. I mean, you can tell consumer you know, goods companies, actually, if you use anthropologists, you're going to understand your consumers better. It's true. You can tell public health sector workers, if you want to get message out about public health, and improve public health, using anthropology, will have you, help you do so, have more resonance. You can tell people who are developing computer programs, if you want to understand the own shortcomings of you as a tech worker and find out how people are actually using technology, try using some anthropology to do that. Over and over and over again, using anthropology is actually very, very beneficial. Um, a message I often give people is that anthropology alone doesn't have the answer, usually. Um, the best way to use anthropology is in combination with another discipline, um, anthropology plus economics, anthropology plus law, anthropology plus medicine, anthropology plus computer science. All of those are really powerful combinations. Um, I sometimes say that anthropology is a bit like salt. 
in that when you add it to food, it binds the ingredients together and makes them taste better. It enriches almost any type of discipline. But, and the point is that using this idea of news that you can use is again, another way to communicate anthropology. And the third point I'd make, because I'm conscious that the news that you can use idea may actually make some anthropologists wince, um, is the third point I wanna make is about compromise. I know that many, many anthropologists hate the idea that their skills could be used to make powerful institutions and people do their work more effectively. And I completely understand that. Um, anthropology has a really unfortunate legacy. Um, the 19th century is full of filthy stuff that anthropologists today could and should be ashamed of. I know that anthropologists don't like the idea often of helping big companies because they don't like capitalism. I know that many anthropologists don't like the idea of helping governments because they often dislike state structures. Some people feel even wary of helping NGOs. Um, I totally understand that and respect that. And every anthropologist has to make their own decision about how they want to use their skills. Um, I personally think that using anthropology to help devise better public policy is very, very commendable. I also think that using anthropology to divide, help NGOs do their work better is very commendable. And I also think that in many cases, anthropologists helping um, companies to be less um, um, exploitative, to be less um, driven by merely the interests of white men, and to be more sensitive towards the world they work, will live in and to try and get a wider sense of their own footprint is very commendable. And I do think that anthropologists have done many good things inside companies. So I'm actually in the camp of saying that actually anthropologists have every right to work in business and actually should work in business. Um, and, you know, I, however, also respect that not all anthropologists agree, but that's what I think personally. Um, but my moral message is that, you know, if you want to communicate more widely what anthropology is and get it into the wider stage, whether it's public policy making or business or anywhere else, you're gonna to have to make compromises, not just about where you work, but also about how you communicate, because there's a fundamental problem about getting anthropology into the public arena, which is the nature of both anthropology as a discipline and the nature of anthropologists. And it's this, to be a brilliant anthropologist, you are basically trained to hide in the bushes and humbly and patiently observe other people and to take yourself out of the picture so that you can absorb information and basically have the humility to listen to what others say without preconception. So anthropologists, if you like, are trained to take themselves out of the picture. It's part of what makes our discipline so powerful. And this is a skill set which is, lies at the heart of the genius of anthropology and which frankly makes the discipline so badly needed in the modern world and so frankly attractive. Anthropologists as a group often gravitate towards anthropology because they're naturally like that. They're often natural chameleons. They often have an interest in trying to explore the world, curious, curiosity. And they often aren't the kind of people who need to grab the microphone and project their own ideas on everyone else. And on top of that, anthropologists are often quite anti-establishment by their nature. That's the kind of personality often goes into it. Um, they often, you know, are pretty suspicious of capitalism to start with and pretty suspicious of power structures and institutions because they either spend their time studying them and get cynical or because that's one reason why they like the idea, idea of anthropology. All of which is fantastic. And frankly, I have many of those instincts myself. Um, all of which is fantastic, but we need to recognize that they make it very, very hard for the discipline of anthropology to hustle for resources or for attention or to communicate. Because if you want to communicate in the modern world, the reality is that you have to be willing to hustle. You have to be willing to stand up and grab the microphone and tell people that you have a brilliant idea. And you have to be willing to communicate in short, sharp, snappy, elevated pitches. 
Um, and if you like to speak in PowerPoints and speak um, in shades of black and white, because that is what the world communicates in, it doesn't generally communicate in shades of subtle gray. And of course, that's again a problem because anthropology is all about subtle gray. Anthropology is all about saying life ain't black and white. It's all about these very subtle spectrums of meaning and the details really matter. And the point is this, if you wanna be an academic anthropologist, you can stay in the world of shades of gray and writing long pieces um, that are lovingly created and subtle. And you can basically live in a world where you don't try and hustle and promote your ideas. If you wanna work in the real world and put anthropology into public discourse, you can have to make some compromises and get used to talking in shades in black and white, in short shots, snappy pictures, get used to thinking about the domino theory, get used to thinking about news you can use and try and find ways to talk and promote the ideas. Now, in my own career, I have decided to make those compromises because I love media, I love anthropology. Um, I've learned to go from being somebody who wanted to hide in the bushes and observe others and was so terrified of ever speaking in public that I used to be physically sick before I went onto a platform or stage. True story. In my 20s, I was so scared of public speaking that I was literally physically sick before I did it. Um, I've made myself get out there and do it over and over and over again to go on television, to do all the public, um, all the public speaking I had to, do all the rituals I had to. I've learned to wear the language, sorry, I've learned to master the language and to wear the clothes and to master the rituals and ceremonies of the Davos tribe to pass as one of them and to do it all and for the most part to do it frankly pretty well. And I've used that platform and pulpit to do my very best to promote anthropology. Um, I'm still at my heart, frankly, somebody who's probably more like the first picture you saw at the beginning, which is that you know girl in the headscarf in the Tajik village who sat there for a year and a half patiently, quietly observing and trying to blend in and hide in the bushes and not speak. But I've done all that because actually, A, I enjoy it, B, it pays the bills. I'm a journalist these days. And C, because I actually hope that in my own way, I can promote anthropology for the wider good. But each of you will have to make your own decisions in your career about how you balance off those competing um, pressures. Some of you may decide that you wanna be like me and say, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna try and use my anthropology. I'm gonna hustle. I'm gonna try and get anthropology ideas out of the mainstream and find ways that they can be used in other non-anthropology contexts. Some of you may say, you know what, that's a complete sellout. I don't like it. I became an anthropologist because I think I want to observe and I don't want to play the game. Totally respect that, totally respect that. I hope that what I do helps you inadvertently, but I totally respect that. But that choice is there for all of you. But I'll just finish by saying, I passionately believe that anthropology is one of the most powerful disciplines out there. It's one of the least respected. It's one of the ones the world needs. And in whatever way you can, do, you can use it, go forth and do so. And I'll just lastly finish by saying, look at Elizabeth for her example of what she's done, for one small inspiration of what's possible and best of luck. And at some point in the future, I hope to come to you in person when I'm not suffering from COVID. So thank you. Thank you for that. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Yeah, thank you. Okay, super. So we wondered, would you be up for taking a few questions? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, great. So we have a traveling mic and I will walk around with the traveling mic. So who has the first burning question? Don't be shy. Remember, that was one of the rules. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, um, how do you mentally prepare yourself to blend in with people like the Davos tribe that you were talking about? <laughs> you mean mentally prepare myself in the sense of dancing with the elite who've messed up the world, or mentally prepare myself? 
in terms of the, you know, the answer is I probably, you know, I mean, um, I try to keep my inside and outside of perspective. I try to treat, I really try to treat Davos as just another um, tribe with weird rituals and language um, who I am both in an insider outsider to. Um, wherever you work as an anthropologist, you face a tension of being an insider outsider. You know, you need to basically immerse yourself enough in that tribe to understand it and to really have empathy for it, but then not become part of it. Um, now I'm I'm in constant danger of becoming part of the Davos elite. Um, you know, and so I have to constantly remind myself to jump in and out. Um, and the other thing is I have to constantly remind myself to ask what people are not, you know, to ask myself, what are people not talking about? What are the social silences? Um, and that's one-on-one -on -one anthropology in any situation. Great response. Uh, Jillian, um, I was wondering if you could give an example of the tech persuasion that you were speaking of where you have an issue that is uh, in the gray and, um, and, and can, you just, can you give an example of how you reframe something that was gray into something black and white so that it could be more In terms of saying that, you know, this is not, it's not um, black and white. Um, okay, let me give you a very timely example, okay, to do with face masks. Um, now, when COVID happened, um, there was right at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, a whole lot of discussion about, but I'm gonna give you two examples, maybe one about Ebola in a moment. There was a whole lot of discussions around, um, does it make sense to wear face masks or not? Now, initially the whole discussion um, around face masks was presented exclusively in terms of the medical physical aspects of face masks. I've got my face mask here because um, I'm, I'm quarantining at home and keeping away from my kids. Um, and so it was all about, does this bit of fabric stop germs from moving or not? Now, as it happens, some of you may know, um, there's been some fantastic work done by anthropologists in Southeast Asia in relation to mask culture. And if any of you are interested in medical anthropology or just want to look at it generally, Google mask culture um, and anthropology and you'll find a lot of this stuff. But you know, basically because you had these um, epidemics in Southeast Asia, SARS and things, um, you know, places like Hong Kong and South Korea all started wearing masks massively. And anthropologists went and studied this. And they realized that actually face masks um, have not just a physical benefit, a medical benefit, but they also have a social and cultural benefit too, because the very act of putting on a face mask each day acts as a psychological prompt that's a habit that makes you change your behavior, but it also is a social signaling device that can basically um, indicate to your group that you are observing the norms of your group and upholding a desire to have responsibility for everyone else. Um, so it shows you're basically trying to be a good, good civic citizen. Now, of course, in America, um, it began to get, it took on that aspect for a while. It also began to get a political signaling device too, unfortunately. But, um, but, um, but basically what you have is this, um, you know, social and cultural aspect to mask wearing. And frankly, that's beneficial. It's another reason for mask wearing. Now, the anthropology around the analysis of all the signaling device around mask wearing is long and complicated. And there's a whole bunch of gray and brilliant, wonderful, beautiful analysis around this, um, which anthropologists could and should talk about at great length, about what you're signaling, why you're signaling, blah, 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 et cetera. If you're, <coughs> if you're trying to communicate the message to health workers at the beginning of a pandemic, about masks and the value of anthropology. You don't want to talk about any of that gray. You don't even want to start talking about the pros and cons of mask signaling, different political affiliation and blah, blah, blah. You just want to tell health workers, get real, 
These are not just about medicine, they're about social and cultural issues too. And if you try and understand the value of this just with medical science, you're missing a trick. You wanna combine medical science with, um, with social science at the same time to understand what's going on. And if you don't combine medical science and social science, you are not gonna have an effective healthcare policy going forward. So that's a kind of one example of how I'm trying to say that, um, which matters enormously, I think. Um, I can give dozens of others, but I think, I, I hope that explains what I mean, is that you wanna, it's back, you wanna really keep it simple, stupid, if you're trying to persuade people and know that there's this whole, you know, old alternative, you know, explanation about what's going on. Um, I often do this again with cryptocurrencies, you know, as an anthropologist, you can sit there and explain cryptocurrencies through extensive analysis of signaling devices, memes of, you know, concepts of trust, horizontal versus vertical trust. Um, all this, there's all this stuff to use in relation to talking about cryptocurrencies to non-anthropologists um, explaining why anthropology matters. But actually the message that right now the financial community and the central banking community needs, and in fact, I gave this just the other day, is very simple. You cannot understand cryptocurrencies just by using economic science. It doesn't work. The numbers do not explain cryptocurrencies. You need to understand social patterns, social signaling devices, networks as well. You need anthropology because things like Elon Musk's um, tweets are a ritualistic signaling device that anthropologists study can understand better than economists. So that's what I mean by black and white. Oh, another example, by the way, is using the word tribe. You know, I mean, anthropologists often hate it because they point out quite correctly that tribe is a much more specific um, political structure um, and people you shouldn't use toss the word loosely because it sounds patronizing. You know, I agree. But guess what? Going back to my domino theory, tribe is something that non-anthropologists understand and it grabs their attention. And then you can say later on, well, actually, it's not really a tribe. But you know, anyway. I'm interested in the idea of trust building with the people that you're hanging out with. I, I think it's really cool and interesting to apply anthropology to people with groups of people with immense power, but it sounds like you're also critical of, you know, the group that you're hanging out with and in a public way as well. And so I'm, I'm wondering how you thought about and navigated throughout your career remaining you know, or keeping and fostering strong trust with the people that you're hanging out with and then perhaps publicly critiquing as well. That basically is how to, how to get people to talk to you without selling out. Um, this is a constant source of angst for me, constant source of angst for me, because, you know, um, you know, in some ways I had sold out, you know, I, I, I live and breathe work amongst these people. Um, you know, that's the reality. Um, it's, it's tough. There aren't any easy answers. You know, I think at the end of the day, empathy is a lot of it, um, you know, and trying to stay true to yourself and make sure that I both am respectful and empathetic, but also, um, also try to express critiques often. You know, David Graeber and all of his anger um, is absolutely justified. And, you know, um, I, you know, you know I, I would strongly, you know, ag agree with, you know, what, a lot of what he said, um, but because of his anger was so public and in your face, um, you know, he didn't get inside, the, you know, the, inside, inside the corridors of power and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping one day I'm going to write a book about the anthropology of the devil's crowd. I mean, I really, really will. I don't tell them that, but I will do. Um, you know, in many ways, that's what, what I'm trying to do right now. Um, but, you know, I think being respectful, empathetic, but also trying to make sure that you're true to yourself is the important thing. Last question. I think I'm last. Um, this is this is Daniel Ginsburg from the okay, AAA. One, 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 one thing quickly there. And by Go the way, it. this issue is really important these days for two reasons. Firstly, that um, you know anthropologists today in the in the West are very, very, very often studying up, and there's a whole literature around studying up and the problems around that. You know, which we all know about. Um, but um, they really are very often studying up. And um, but secondly, we need to study up because no one else is going to do that. There's a dire, dire, the biggest social silence today is a lack of cultural analysis and the lack of sort of, you know, trying to look at social silences amongst powerful people and studying up. Um, 
And, you know, that is absolutely critical. And, um, you know, books like Winner Take All, um, who, by the way, coming back to how I, you know, live with myself with what I'm doing, um, many of you may have seen um, Anand, Anand's work. And if you haven't read Winner Take All, read it. Um, but I had a dinner the other day for someone who should remain nameless, who's very much part of the Davos tribe, talking about some of the work he's doing. And I had a dinner party. And I deliberately invited Anand along as well, because although these two people had clashed on a public stage, I thought that's one way to expose the critique of the elite to the elite. So I tried to bring them together. And it was a very, quite, quite a sort of lively dinner party, but that's, you know, um, but we need people who are, have the courage to study up. We need that very badly today. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, so this is Daniel Ginsburg from the AAA. Um, right. I wanted to hey. thank you for, hi, I wanted to thank you for your comments about um, the compromises that you have to make. I really relate to that as somebody who works in the nonprofit sector, but I wanted to respond to it also and propose that it's not a question of whether you make compromises so much as which compromises you make. Okay. Um, so my field work now is not among the Davos elite, it's among the Princeton, Chicago, UCLA elite. <laughs> and, and if you look at, for example, tenure and promotion guidelines, that is nothing more than a list of the compromises that you have to make in that industry. Academia is an industry like any other. And to get ahead in it, you have to play the game. And I think um, for us as anthropologists, it behooves us not to get too sucked into that industry if it happens to be the industry that we're working in and to perceive it as value neutral and the true way of doing unfiltered anthropology. There's no getting out of institutions and it's always something. Yeah, I mean, Daniel, I think you put that beautifully and I, I salute you. And by the way, I salute the work the AAA has done because um, when I first gave a speech um, to the AAA about a dozen years ago, about more than that, um, talking about it's time for anthropologists to get out of the bushes. Um, I Some of the anthropologists are so angry, they vandalized my Wikipedia page repeatedly. Um, I think the AAA has done amazing, it's a true story. Um, the AAA has done amazing, amazing um, work in the last um, 10, 15 years to really engage with where the world's going. And I really salute what the AAA is doing on that front, you know, so... Um, you know, that, that's terrific. And I, you know, salute what Elizabeth's doing and everyone else in relation to that. Um, you know, the reality is academia, as Pierre Bourdieu, who in many ways is my intellectual lodestar and is still my intellectual lodestar, um, Pierre Bourdieu, you know, said all that himself when he, you know, wrote all these wonderful pieces about, you know, the French academic world and the problems with that. Um, you know, academia isn't as pure. You know, one of the bitter ironies about, you know, anthropology is that it goes out and studies the social social structures and tribalism of others without looking at how anthropology itself is so tribal. And I wrote a column which is going up, um, in fact, it's up already online, um, but it'll be in Saturday's paper about the work of Axel Lienhufford, who was an economist who wrote about the tribalism of the economics profession. Wonderful um, article called Life Amongst the Econ that you should read, where he lambasted economists for behaving in a tribal way. But I pointed out that actually, you know, every discipline is tribal. And looking, you know, anyone who thinks of being an academic is somehow a protection from that should think again. So the point is this, you know, we're all, we're all less than perfect, um, wherever we end up. And there's no point in lamenting that, guess what, it's called being human. But instead, we should use that to remind ourselves to be humble, and to observe others with empathy, and then try to essentially go back to one-on-one anthropology, which is to make the strange familiar, get inside other people's heads, so we can then make the familiar strange, look at ourselves critically, so that we can then, most of all, importantly of all, use our special superpower of anthropology, which is to look at social silence and tell other people about the social silences we're missing, so that we can then hopefully work together to build a better world. Okay, thank you so much.